Uh, good evening. Welcome to the most uh, recent installment of Building the Scottish State. And I have the great pleasure of having with me uh, Professor Nicolo Levra from the University of Geneva uh, Center of Global Studies and uh, to talk about um, self-determination, EFTA, the EU, and any other thing that any other subject that comes up. So first of all, Nicola, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Well, thanks for the invitation. I think it's a great moment where we see all these things happening in Europe, and I really hope things will turn the right way for Scotland. Yeah, okay. And how do you see it at this point with Scotland? And and in turn, because within Scotland, I mean, I, I follow the, you know, the, the, the news very closely. And there's the idea, and Nicola Sturgeon has said in the campaign that she wants to have a Section 30 uh, referendum, and uh, which is not at all guaranteed to be accorded by the uh, uh, Boris Johnson, whoever, or whoever might be the prime minister in the coming weeks. Uh, what are the, how do you see alternate routes to independence? What would be, and, and the basis of it, according to Nicola Sturgeon, is that we must, you know, Scotland must have an internationally accepted uh, means of uh, achieving independence that will be recognized by other countries. Uh, but a referendum is not the only way to achieve independence. So how do you see that in terms of, um, you know, international recognition and, uh, you know, a referendum as opposed to other possible means to achieve independence? Well, uh, good question. And I would say, even though it's not a formal requirement by international law, that's independence following a clear expression of the will of a clear majority of the people is the best way to reach independence. Mm. So I, I would say referendum is most likely the best way to uh, ground the claim for sovereignty. And if we look at what happened in Europe in the past 20 years, uh, most new states that emerge uh, held referenda. Not all, mm -hmm. but most of them. For example, Slovenia and Croatia that used to be provinces of uh, the Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia. They held referendum in 91, and then they were ultimately, it took some time, it was complex, but they, they got recognized as sovereign state. Uh, same in the Baltic states. So uh, again, if, even though it's not a formal requirement, I would say it's the best way to uh, ground the claim for independence and sovereignty. Now, how and under which term the referendum is to be organized is another issue. Mm -hmm. And that's a complex one. Uh, clearly, provision of national law cannot trump the rights, which comes from international law, to mm -hmm. have self-expression of the people. Mm -hmm. And self-determination is about that. So um, whether the referendum should be held according to domestic provision of UK legislation or not, I would say is not, is internationally not relevant. Mm -hmm. Now in practice, uh, we've seen, for example, what happened in Catalonia in 2017. Uh, well, I guess, I'm certain, uh, the UK government wouldn't send troops and yeah. uh, police forces as they did in Catalonia. But it's easier if you do it by mutual consent with uh, the sovereign power at the time of the referendum. Mm -hmm. And again, the result of the referendum is open. I mean, Scotland had a referendum in 2014 and the result was negative. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say it will be hard to do it without a referendum, but now under which term the referendum is to be organized, that's another issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and do you see other ways of doing it? For example, if there is, um, <clears throat> if, if uh, for example, there is a, uh, if the if the SNP and ALBA and other pro-independence pro -independence parties constitute a majority within the parliament, uh, and they still there's there's still a continued refusal on the part of the um, of the UK government to uh, allow for a referendum, 
Uh, and for example, if they had a vote saying, you know, a, a UDI, for example, and, or, or a, an assertion of sovereignty, do you think that could be recognized on an international basis? If, if you know, if, if different countries clearly saw the situation they were in and that because there's different, you know, uh, how, how do you see that? Okay, I, I think there are two issues behind that. First, would it be legal or not to do it without a referendum? And that we know the answer. The answer is yes, it could be legal. Mm -hmm. In 2010, the International Court of Justice was asked by the General Assembly of the UN uh, of an advisory opinion to decide whether the declaration of independence by the Assembly of Kosovo, it was mm -hmm. not a referendum, it was the elected assembly, was in violation of international law or not. Mm -hmm. And very clearly, the court said it's not illegal. Yeah. So the question of whether it would be legal or not is not a very serious issue. It would be legal under international law, even if it's not legal under domestic law. Mm -hmm. Now comes the second more difficult matter, whether it will be recognized by other countries. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there is no compulsory rule of international law that force any country to recognize any other country. So this is where I say it will depend, naturally. If you have a decision by uh, Hollywood and people come out in the street cheering and there is no problem and so on, it will probably help other countries to recognize this decision. But now if you have strong contestation of a decision by parliament, it will be more tricky for the country to recognize independent Scotland if there is very strong opposition inside Scotland saying, well, we didn't vote, we didn't have a referendum. Mm -hmm. So the issue of recognition, but by the way, even if you have a purely legal referenda, the other states are not obliged to recognize, mm -hmm. but it will make easier, definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I guess you've seen uh, this open letter that was uh, published in uh, British press today, yeah. uh, saying that Scotland should be offered uh, immediate membership to the European Union, and naturally to be a member of the European Union, you would need to be a state. It's mm -hmm. written in the treaty, there is no provision allowing a non-state entity to become a member state of the Union. Mm -hmm. So if that uh, principle were to be followed and Scotland would be promised joining the EU after a referendum, or after a decision of parliament, then it would imply recognition. Mm -hmm. But again, recognition is left to the free will of every other state. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and is there a certain, okay, assuming that, uh, let, let's just, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, imagine that the, the new, within the next couple of months that the Scottish Parliament votes for, uh, to assert that it is sovereign, that the, 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 the Scottish Parliament is sovereign, and therefore it has the uh, ability to uh, uh, sign and ratify international treaties and the powers to abide by them. And, and I spoke to officials at EFTA, and that is what they require in terms of, uh, you know, what is necessary to uh, apply to be an EFTA member. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're very, they're not quite as, I guess they're not quite as um, strict on this notion of statehood as the European Union uh, would be. Uh, how do you see that? Do you see that, uh, do you see that, um, you know, if, um, if Scotland were to affirm that you know uh, declares sovereignty, and to do, and to affirm that it had this capacity to negotiate and ratify international treaties and to abide by them. Do you think that that would be enough to uh, 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 not only join EFTA but perhaps be recognized by other states? I know I know it's not been done before in this way. Of course, everything is uh, you know is a uh, is a precedent. But how do you how do you see that? Yeah, as I said, this is why it's an interesting time where exploring new, new ground uh, in politics and in law. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I find all these processes fascinating. Now, to be absolutely frank, no, I don't think EFTA would accept Scotland just because Scotland says it is sovereign. You have to realize EFTA is uh, now reduced to a few states, 
Mm -hmm. And definitely, EFTA would be interested to have more member states, clearly. Mm -hmm. But these few states are Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Mm -hmm. And these states are very dependent for economic reason, for political stability, to their relation with the European Union. Mm -hmm. And I would say these states would be cautious because naturally, if they accept, it's a state that would accept. So they would sign a, a, a treaty admitting Scotland as a self-proclaimed state that nobody else has recognized. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there are that type of daring countries Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland would, uh, I couldn't say for sure about Iceland, I don't know much. Uh, mm -hmm. But Norway and Switzerland, I don't think they'll take the risk to be the first one to recognize, because de facto that would be recognizing uh, Scotland's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe there could be other form of association, who knows? Uh, mm -hmm. But no, I, I don't think Switzerland and Norway would take the first step to be the first countries to de facto recognize uh, and the EUA actually by signing with Scotland. Mm -hmm. So okay. it, it would be a bit more complex, but where you're right is that the, the procedure to enter is much lighter at EFTA than it is at the EU. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and what are, and it, it help us compare being a member of EFTA relative to being a member of the EU, assuming Scotland becomes independent in some way and is, has sovereignty and is able to, you know, sign international treaties and ratify them and abide by them. Um, what, what, assuming that, you know, like EFTA said, okay, we'll give you this offer or the EU said this offer, you're, you, you live in Switzerland, so you're, you're part of, you know, Switzerland's part of the F, uh, part of EFTA. How do you compare the different uh, memberships and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Okay, first, yes, Switzerland is part of EFTA and actually EFTA headquarters are based in Geneva. So uh, I go there from time to time. Yes, we know uh, this organization. Just a bit of history, you have to remember EFTA was, let's say a concurrent project to the European communities which was actually launched by the UK and mm -hmm. the Nordic country mostly and Switzerland and a few other. Uh, so naturally it was a serious blow to EFTA when in 1972, UK and Denmark uh, and Ireland joined the EU, it shrank down EFTA. And then after uh, 1989 in the nineties, you have three other major states Sweden, Austria, and Finland. Finland joined later, but uh, it was part of EFTA, who left. So there are very few states left in EFTA, only four of them. So it's a free trade agreement, but not a very interesting one. Basically, trading with Norway, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein, it's not big markets. Mm -hmm. What would be interesting, on the other hand, is that EFTA countries have special relationship with the EU. In, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, EFTA countries realized that they may be lost in a big Europe with many countries and they wanted to sever ties with the uh, actually nascent EU because EU is born with the Maastricht Treaty, 1992. So mm -hmm. at that time, EU was reforming and EFTA country felt that it was time to get close ties, economic ties with the European communities to become the EU. So it was negotiated and signed and ratified the European Economic Area. Mm -hmm. It's a treaty of 92 and it's open. Well, it's, it's open to discussion, but basically it's EFTA state with the EU. Right, yes. Um, actually, I suppose... And, 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 and Switzerland is not part of the EEA, is that correct? Exactly. Switzerland is member of EFTA, but in 1992, in December 1992, because Switzerland, as you know, and maybe it's also why I have a bias for referenda, but in Switzerland, the <laughs> population is quite often called to vote 
Actually, we vote four times a year on different referenda or initiative. And if you want to have fun, you can go and look on the official site of the Swiss Federal Chancellery. You have voting dates until 2038. We don't know the objects, but we already are agree on the date. That's the Swiss way of doing things. So four times a year, we can vote on any object that will come to the vote. And in December 92, Swiss population voted against the ratification of the European Economic Area. Okay. So it took another 10 years for Switzerland to negotiate some alternative arrangement with EU. So we lost 10 years with serious economic damage and so on. But finally, we have what we call now the, the bilateral path, meaning that we have specific agreements, sectoral agreements between the EU and Switzerland. We have about 108, uh, 120 of these agreements and it's very complex to manage. It's, it's time consuming and so on, but Switzerland can, let's say, uh, afford it mm -hmm. for two reasons. First, as you probably know, Switzerland, a lot of money is coming to Switzerland. So Switzerland uh, has some leeway as regard uh, its economy, but even more important, Switzerland happens to be neighbor to the three big founding member of the EU. Mm -hmm. Germany on the north, Italy in the south, and French uh, on the west side. Mm -hmm. And especially between Italy and Germany, clearly the shortest way is across Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good negotiation, negotiation chip for Swiss negotiators. Basically, EU needs to have agreements with Switzerland. EU does not necessarily need to have agreement with Iceland or, or with Scotland, actually, for this, this geographical reason. Mm -hmm. So this okay. is why Switzerland could offer it, afford to have this special way. But the okay. other one, in the, go ahead. Go ahead. in the European Economic Area, uh, naturally, if Scotland was to join e, uh, EFTA, it could immediately uh, Ask to join the European Economic Area. That's that's what I was told. Yes, yes, that's yes, what I was told. that's true. But European Economic Area is in EU uh, saying what we call a mixed agreement. So it's not only between EU and a new EFTA member states, but it's between EU and all its member states and this new state. So it could take some time mm -hmm. to have the ratification, but we have all sort of procedures uh, allowing for uh, anticipatory implementation and so on. So that, that, would, that would work to join okay. EFTA and then to join the European Economic Area in which you almost have all the, all the access to single market. You have to take over legislation from the EU and uh, you just don't have, let's say political participation to uh, the council, the European parliament and so on, mm -hmm. but you, economically entirely integrated in the EU single market. Okay, and, and do you see any big disadvantages to being members of EFTA and not the EU? Um, I think it's a matter of preference. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, uh, yes, you should be able to afford it. Norway can afford it because they've got gas and petrol, and by the way, maybe our listeners don't know, but Norway applied to join the uh, European communities in 1971 alongside the UK, Ireland, and Denmark. And so they, they negotiate the uh, adherence to the EU or European community at that time. And then they had a referendum in 72, and they said, no, finally, we don't want to join. Mm -hmm. And in 1994, again, Norway negotiated joining the EU, and again, no, Norwegian population voted against uh, joining the EU. So they have their reasons, same for Swiss. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say the cost not being a member is that you do not participate to decision-making. Mm -hmm. You accept to be satellized politically by EU. If you're in, you're part of the political process. So I would say, at least for Switzerland, I, I don't want to uh, be too uh, assertive about what's going on in Norway, uh, but in Switzerland, uh, we clearly prefer 
to be satellite to the EU, not to participate to decision making and have a little bit, a little bit of uh, leeway as regards the implementation of European law. Mm. It's really, it, we just pretend. Uh, actually, our politicians have invented this great um, saying, it, we, we adapt our law to EU law all the time. We're not obliged to it, but we, ha we have to do it for economic mm -hmm. reasons. Okay. So we call that autonomous adaptation. But basically, we, we have no choice. We need to, to follow. So again, then it's, it, it's probably mostly a symbolic matter, whether you want to be part of the club and play the rule of the game and so on. And personally, I'm quite sad that Switzerland does not want to participate to this great political and economic project that is the EU. Or you don't want to be in, but you have to follow the rules because that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. So, so personally, you would prefer if if Switzerland was a member of the EU and and fully participating in the decision making process. Sure, and maybe we would have interesting experience to bring to the EU. Just think about that. Switzerland is a federal state, as EU is a, some sort of a federation with twenty six member states in Switzerland. 27 mm -hmm. in the EU. And by the way, in Switzerland, if you read the federal constitution, Article 3 says the cantons, which is the name of our uh, regional entities, the, the federal constitution says the cantons are sovereigns, except as limited by the constitution. So it looks very much like the EU treaty. And mm -hmm. even better, we have a government with no prime minister, no president. Well. Formally, we have a president who changes every year, but it's like the commission. It's a collegial government. Mm. So basically, if there's one political system that looks like the EU, it happens to be Switzerland. So I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but certainly many of the practices that Swiss politicians and Swiss lawyers have developed would be useful inside the EU and it would be great if we could contribute. Now, we mostly follow our economic interests, which are saved through these bilateral agreements and this idea of being a sovereign state. But, you know, sovereignty nowadays is something that is not exactly the same as it used to be. Yeah. And by the way, Switzerland is a neutral country. So I always ask my fellow citizens, by the way, I'm also French, so I'm a citizen. <laughs> uh, I don't have my passport with me, but I've got both. Me too. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> the best of both worlds. Um, so despite Brexit, you're still a, an EU citizen. Good for you. Yeah. Um, but then um, I would say that Yes, this know-how, this practice of federalism that exists in Switzerland uh, would, should be shared with our fellow uh, EU country, con well, I, I feel like, like a EU citizen, and I, I guess most Swiss people, I mean, they don't want to be in the political system. It, it has to do with history. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, if you look at the history of Switzerland, it was built progressively each canton joining started in 2091, long ago, and each canton slowly joined. The last one to join was uh, Geneva in 1850. Mm -hmm. So it's about 500 years before it started and Geneva decided to join. And why does Geneva join? Because there was this guy called Napoleon that unified Europe in his way. Not, not the center of Switzerland, but Geneva was not part of Switzerland. So we were swept in this empire by Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And then when he got defeated, not by us, by others, um, we said, okay, maybe we better join this Swiss group. So we accept to not to be an independent city, we become part of Switzerland because it's a guarantee not to be part of a European project. Mm -hmm. And the first one in 1291 that created Switzerland was not to be swept by the Habsburg family, which were conquering Europe at that time. So in, in the identity of Switzerland, there's this idea that we don't want to be part of big European projects. Mm. 
So then it's difficult to win a referendum to join the EU with that premise in our history. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think it's the same thing for Scotland. Good for them. Okay. And and um, okay. Let, let, let's assume that Scotland is able to declare its uh, sovereignty in some way, uh, and it becomes a member of EFTA. What type of relationship can be uh, can be obtained? Uh, and and I'm thinking. Of, uh, so, for example, they, they you know assuming. Uh, that they could get back into the EEA with the members of the, with the with the EFTA members of the EEA, with the four excluding Switzerland because they're not in the EEA, uh, getting getting them back. Could Scotland um, participate in, all, in the different programs, like or, uh, um, for example Erasmus or other research programs? Could they and, and crucially, could they could Scotland negotiate? As a member of EFTA, could Scotland negotiate participation in the customs union uh, as well as the single market? Sure. Uh, again, if you join EFTA and then you accept the European Economic Area, you've got all the policies, you've got all the programs. Mm -hmm. Naturally, you have to contribute somehow, not to the EU budget, but special contribution. But yes, you're part of the customs union, you're part of the single market, you're fully integrated, except for political representation. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, you almost have everything. And by the way, most people don't know that, but uh, Norway is member of Schengen area. Mm -hmm. Uh, you probably never knew that in Scotland because the UK didn't want to be. And even Switzerland, that is not part of EEA, European Economic Area, is part of Schengen Area. Mm -hmm. So, yes, basically you get everything except political participation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is that up for negotiation? Mean, uh, so, so say, for example, um, within the, the, you know, I don't know, the next, the coming months, Scotland is recognized as having a sovereign parliament. They were able to get into EFTA, uh, and then the EFTA helps the helps Scotland get back into the EEA. Where would they go for? I mean, and and so as I understand it, I'm you know this is you know I've, I've been developing my knowledge over this over the past weeks. But are they able to pick and choose what? EU programs they want to go, uh, nego uh, take part in? Can they, uh, do they have to go negotiate with the, e the EU over whether they're part of the customs union? How, how could that conceivably work? No, European Economic Area, it's a package. You get okay. it all, while well, you can negotiate a few exception, uh, but it's really no. The, the principle is it's a package. You, let's say, uh, like a passive member of the European Union. Mm -hmm. But you have all the economic advantage, you participate to all the programs, you can lead research programs, you can... Uh, everything uh, is granted, but you don't benefit directly from EU budget. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. always through more complex way, you contribute, you get money back and so on. So you, you do not contribute to the EU budget, but somehow you contribute more or less the same amount of money. Okay. So, so yes, you fully in. If you don't want to be fully in and to negotiate piecemeal agreement, it's possible, it's, it's the Swiss way. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of time. As I told you, even Switzerland being in the middle of Europe, so there was a need for Germany and Italy and probably France to get some agreements with Switzerland. So for example, that the trucks could go through Switzerland. Yeah. Before we sign uh, the bilateral agreements, a series of bilateral agreement in 2000, which entered into force in 2002, uh, trucks going through Switzerland could not be loaded with more than 28 tons. Whereas in the EU, it was 40 tons. Mm. So it meant that trade going through truck between Germany and Italy was limited to 28 ton a truck. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of costs because it's the same trucks, but you cannot load them full. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, Switzerland used this position to negotiate this against uh, free movement of person, but not against this and that. It's possible, but it's difficult. Look at what's going on now with between the UK and uh, the EU. 
yeah. uh, this trade uh, agreement, the TCA, you have a nice envelope and some institutions and so on. But basically, as if you look at substance, there's not much. And it will take years and years and years for proper access to the EU market to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, um, and as, a, uh, as a, a, a Switzerland, as a member of EFTA, but not of the EEA, as, as far as I understand it, you have to have signed a lot of bilateral agreements, as you were saying before, and it's, uh, it's very complicated. Would you, uh, I mean, just personally, would you prefer that uh, uh, Switzerland be part of the EEA? Would that simplify things to a large degree? Or not, not, that, you have, not that you can like maybe wave a magic wand and change that, but... Uh, mm, no. Uh, I mean, basically the EEA... As I say, to me, it doesn't make much sense. You have to take over and implement all EU legislation. You, you have to follow EU rules in everything, except that you do not vote on the rules. Naturally, if you're a small country, you're probably not the one uh, beating up the tempo for EU decisions. But still, you participate, and maybe you can create coalition and so on. So um, I don't see any advantage to be part of the EA. And as you say, it makes things much simpler. And as you probably know, I'm a lawyer, an international lawyer. So the complex relationship between Switzerland and EU is great for my business. They always <laughs> come and say, oh, we need advice. No problem, <laughs> you get it. So, but, but, but to be honest, yeah, it's, it's not very efficient. And now we're in a crisis in our relationship with the EU because the EU, would like all these 120 bilateral agreements to be put under a framework agreement, which has some dispute settlement mechanism and so on. And a majority of Swiss people do not want that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and if, uh, if Scotland were to become part of EFTA, you know, within the coming you know, weeks, months, whatever, uh, does anything exclude them from joining the EU afterwards? Because I know that you know, Portugal and, Nor uh, and Denmark and others have been EFTA members and become EU members. But is the, I mean, could, the, could EFTA be seen as kind of a halfway house to becoming EU members later? I don't think so. Uh, actually, you write about Portugal, the UK, uh, Ireland, they were all in EFTA. But even more interesting, and there have been a lot of debate about that. When in 1990, 91, and uh, 92, the EEA was negotiated between EFTA member states and the EU, it was seen by many countries as, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the English name, uh, marche pied, we say in French. Uh, uh, go, going up by ste step it, by it's step. It's a step. It's a step towards joining the the EU, and yeah. actually, uh, the EEA agreement entered into force in 1994, with not only Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, but also Sweden, Austria, and Finland. And within one year, they moved to join the EU. So no, it, it's rather seen as a, a step toward joining. And when there was the enlargement, the big enlargement between the 90s and 2004, at some point it was considered that maybe this candidate country should first join the EA as kind of an anti-chambre. Anti uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anti-chamber, yeah. Yeah, and, half, and, halfway, and then halfway house, halfway house, yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah. And, and then it would make it easier for them to, to walk in. But it didn't work that way because the economies, the problem was more the economies than the political system. And naturally, if you're in the European economic area, you're in the single market. So competition law applies, you have you, you cannot have border control and so on. So the problem with these countries was that. If they were joining EEA, there was a fear that they wouldn't, the economy would not survive, actually. So this is why they were kept out and prepared to be ready to join directly the EU. But otherwise, no, I think uh, it would be a, a very good step towards uh, future membership to the European Union. And European Union would certainly welcome any EFTA member state that wants to join.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as as I understand it, having spoken with uh, having spoken with EFTA, uh, you know, uh, officials, uh, it could be done quite rapidly and get Scotland at least back in the uh, in the in the uh, you know in the market. Uh, you know, for fisheries and uh, agriculture and this type of thing. And then, you know, with a view later, perhaps towards joining the EU, but, you know, but in, but in a much more tranquil uh, context, rather than being desperate to, you know, join to get back into the single market, if they were in EFTA, you know, in the single market, in the, it, and, uh, in, and able to join the EU in a much more relaxed atmosphere. I mean, the, the, would sure. you see it that way? Again, if you are in EFTA and you accept European economic area, you're in the single market. No customs, no... It's as a okay. member as we got economic rights. Okay. For, so your producers, your farmers, everybody is inside the market. Same rule apply. So, yes, actually, um, in economic terms, certainly, it is exactly the same as being a member. Mm -hmm. or almost like that. Okay. If I want to be very precise, there are a few nuances, but it's really marginal. Okay. Because because as far as I understood, I, I the, the um, it was a question of the customs union. I understood. I mean, and I don't fully understand all of this, so you can help me. You can help me understand. But the, uh, from what I understood, the EEA, you were in the a single market, but not necessarily the customs union. And, I'm, and so I wasn't sure whether Norway or Iceland was in the customs union uh, or Liechtenstein, uh, you know, uh, are they, or can they, uh, if Scotland would become a member of EFTA, could they negotiate in the customs union or is it all part of a package? Uh, how, uh, how? No, uh, actually, uh, as we are the external effect, uh, Norway can sign uh, free trade agreement with foreign countries, uh, whereas member states of the EU cannot. Mm. It's a competence that has been delegated to the European, uh, to the EU and exerted by the European Commission. So uh, it is true, EFTA member states uh, formally are not part of the uh, custom union. Mm. Uh, they, they are represented at the World Trade Organization, whereas, as you know, uh, EU member states, they have signed the treaty, they're formally member, but they renounce their representation. It's been given to the European Commission. So, yes, as we have external relations, so not with the EU, but with China or US and whatsoever, you do not benefit from the uh, trade or customer agreement that are signed by the EU, and you can sign your own, you can negotiate your own. Okay, and, and imagine. Um, okay, and and what do you see as if Scotland were to become, come, you know, sovereign, independent, you know, uh, and they were members of EFTA? What could their relationship be with the rest of the UK? Uh, and you know, there's all this stuff going up about you know, oh, borders and you know, currency and you know, a lot of stuff flown up, you know, about that that you know, kind of scare stories about that, but. As I understand it, as an EFTA member, Scotland would be able to negotiate trade deals with individual states, for example, the RUK, and negotiate, you know, the the, the, the border relations and trade relations with the RUK or the or Ireland or whatever. Uh, is that how? I mean, obviously, it's never been done before, but how do you how do you see that? Is that is that a liberty of EFTA members to? Uh, I, I've seen that it's they have the member they, they have the liberty to sign free trade deals with other countries, but I'm assuming that would extend to the RUK and be able to negotiate trade terms uh, with the RUK and border controls that kind of thing. Is is that how you see it? Uh, yes, in legal terms, uh, but as you probably know, uh, the the international world is not only regulated by law. And as you've seen with the Northern Ireland situation, I don't want to expand on it, but basically the EU is very wary that there is no backdoor allowing UK producer and so on to discreetly enter uh, the single market. Mm -hmm. So legally, yes, it would be possible to sign any sort of agreement with the UK. In practice, I do have my doubts. Uh, as I said, um, 
even if you have the right, sometimes it's difficult to exert that right. Yeah. Exactly. So it it would be, I'm certain on that issue, it would very quickly made it quite clear to the Scotland, assuming, as you say, that it is part of EFTA and so on, that somehow they have to choose. They cannot give any concession so that uh, every producer in the what is left of the UK uh, maybe it'll, they'll change name at some point if Scotland needs and others, but uh, whatever is left can just channel all its good uh, through Scotland so that it's then inside the single market. Uh, there would be pressure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, going to some of the questions, uh, could European overview of referendum arrangements of Scotland be arranged? You know, I guess, in other words, could there be, if there was a referendum, could there be oversight by the, uh, by, by, the uh, by, by, by the EU or to make sure that it's uh, valid? It could happen. Uh, it's a matter of political will. Mm -hmm. As you know, Catalans, when they tried to organize a referendum in 2017, and actually, they did not succeed. They were prevented physically to properly organize a referendum, but they tried to have as many international observers as possible. Now, it's one thing to have a member of European Parliament coming and saying, OK, I, I will supervise pro proper organization of a referendum in Scotland or Catalonia. Uh, and it's another thing having the European Parliament deciding to send a delegation. Mm -hmm. So. As, I don't know. It will be interesting to, to see how things evolve. Uh, but I'm not sure in the coming months, if things were to happen quickly, that the European institutions would be willing to take an institutional commitment to supervising the referendum. Mm -hmm. uh, again, certainly there would be some individuals and so on, as they have been in Catalonia, as they have been actually in the 2014 referendum in Scotland, uh, but EU as such, uh, there would be a lot of pressure inside because you're probably not naive. You can imagine that if Scotland were to be recognized as an independent state and allowed sooner or later to join the EU, that would certainly uh, empower Catalans, Basques, Flemish and others to try to follow the same path. Yeah. Everybody is very aware of that. So that would be a matter of political will. Actually, personally, I think the EU should not be afraid of such an evolution. That's probably the best future they can have to reform their own institutions, which in are in bad need for reforms. Absolutely. Uh, and it's not the current member states that will help reform. So it could make sense. But as you also know, the main power holder inside the EU, especially now that we have this European Council as an institution, are the government of the member states. Yeah. So political will may be difficult to, to have. Yeah. But it could be true. Okay. Another question, which I'll kind of rephrase, uh, it won't be illegal for Scotland to have a, a referendum under Scott law. English law is different, so it's nothing to do with them. And I think this gets back to the Kosovo decision, which we discussed earlier, and the submission that the uh, UK made in that case, which basically said that the, 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 the uh, a, 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 sorry, a successor state cannot be bound by the laws of the original state in achieving independence. And I'm just wondering like how you saw uh, if, if you know, the, the, Scot the Scottish were able to get, uh, were able to achieve independence democratically and peacefully, but outside of the, the UK legal system, uh, could that be recognized or under, under what circumstances maybe could it be recognized? Any circumstances. Again, as I said, the issue of recognition is left to the free will of other states. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually in practice, most states 
before becoming independent, had recourse to different means that were not in accordance with the legislation of the dominating sovereign state that was covering this territory. And yeah. most, let's say, leaders of uh, independence movement were qualified as terrorists by the um, former state. So it, it, it's not a new process. And very clearly, there is a rule of international law, of general international law, that says that no state can invoke its domestic legislation in order not to fulfill its international obligation. Hmm. And if you look at the most fundamental document of the current international society, I, I mean the most fundamental legal document. Hmm. I'm a lawyer, I don't know, maybe there are fundamental documents which are not legal, but the most fundamental legal document is the UN Charter. And in Article 1st, first article of the UN Charter lays down the equal rights of the people, all people, to self-determination. So this is positive law. And it has been embedded... That, what, what, do you, what do you mean by positive law? I, I saw in the conference last night you evoking that, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I understand the difference between negative and positive rights, but what do you mean by positive law? Positive law is law that is into force, that is into treaties that have been signed and accepted by states. And UK, as many other states, as Spain, as many others, they're all members of the UN. And actually, this right to self-determination of the people, naturally, and this is what we discussed last uh, evening in that conference, whether it was limited to decolonization or not, it was widely used to promote decolonization, but it is clearly not limited to decolonization. Mm -hmm. It's a right that is binding on every state on the planet, mm -hmm. or at least every state which is member of the UN, but basically- Yeah, there are uh, that, that is the right, just to be clear, that is, that is the right to self-determination. Exactly, yeah, and yeah. it belongs to all people. And no state, which is respectful of international law, and, and usually as we are European state, its own domestic legislation, because all European states recognize uh, that they're bound by the international legal commitment, no state can invoke domestic legislation to prevent the realization of this right to self-determination. Even more, the International Court of Justice and also, by the way, the European Court of Justice in 2017 and 2018 decision recognized this right to self-determination as a right erga omnes, meaning it's a right against or that can be opposed to any state. Yeah. You don't need to have a special legal relationship with a state. So it's really, I would say, the second category in the hierarchy of international law. You have mm -hmm. use cogens. I don't think a right to self-determination is use cogens because use cogens cannot be dealt with by treaty. And actually, you could have separation uh, of states through treaty. So it's not use cogens, but it's ega omnes. It's really the second highest level. So basically, even if uh, the legislation or the political power in the UK doesn't want to adopt the proper legislative acts within the UK legal order, as we got international law, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, another question, which I'm slightly rephrasing, regarding whether uh, what, what to stop Nicholas Sturgeon opening EU discussions after the next. Uh, if, if there's an SNP majority elected, could they open up discussions with the EU on, uh, or would they have to be in, come independent first? And that's my my idea is that probably they have to have recognition and independence before they would open negotiations with the EU, but what's your view? Oh, it's not only my view. Uh, no, actually, naturally it would depend on the EU, but maybe you can look, you find that on the, the internet at the agenda of the president of the European Council, Charles Michel. This week he was meeting with the president of Kosovo, which is not, as far as I know, a state under international law. It doesn't have full recognition. It has a degree of recognition, but not. And actually, in the agenda, it's very interesting because there's kind of a asterisk and there's a footnote saying, uh, it doesn't mean we recognize Kosovo. 
but we we discuss with them. Mm -hmm. So yes, sure. Uh, negotiation could actually even start next week um, if someone in the EU institution is willing to uh, discuss with anyone representing uh, Scotland. Naturally, I guess, and I understand that it would be better to have it after the election, but it will depend. My guess is that um, the high representative uh, for foreign policy will not be willing to discuss with Scotland because Mr. Borrell uh, is a Catalan I mean, against I, yeah. Catalan independence. He tried everything he could when he was foreign minister of Spain to put in jail those who left the country. Yeah, so he, he will be he opposed. Were... And I, I'm not trying to point out on him, but to say inside the EU institution, there will be resistance. Mm. But nothing prevents maybe the president of the commission or the president of the council to accept having talks or to arrange some sort of, you know, meeting yeah. by chance. Um, international relation is, is a subtle game. Mm. So formal negotiation would be difficult, I guess. Mm -hmm. But contacts and some sort of discussion, maybe not officially negotiation. I don't think EU institution would admit that they negotiate officially, but that they could discuss would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, let's see, in the event of Scotland becoming independent, how would you see this affecting the RUK in terms of trade, in regards to trading and relationship with the European states? That may be a kind of a complicated question, but. Uh, um... Well, uh, so far, the EU member states have been quite holding together within the EU for any discussion, bilateral discussion with the UK. There are not many bilateral discussion with the UK. I mean, there are some informal, but formally, it's really if the UK wants to negotiate any trade deals or whatsoever with EU member states, it has to go through the EU institutions. So that wouldn't change much for the UK, I think. Uh, now, as we got relationship with other countries like Switzerland, uh, by the way, Switzerland has uh, updated its agreement with the UK uh, when Brexit became effective. So, so there are some possibility for bilateral relation. But again, it's not very big markets. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it would have any major impact, uh, except that, well, you know, UK losing parts, uh, you know, it's like if you, you have to decide whether you take a plane and you see it landing and it's losing parts, maybe you won't insist to get on that plane. So yeah, UK should be worried if it starts losing parts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, would joining and then leaving EFTA not be a long drawn out process, especially leaving other Nordic relations who might feel uh, used by us going? Uh, let's see, so uh, assuming, let's just assume that Scotland uh, was able to join EFTA and was later able to join the EU. I mean, do you see that as a relatively fluid process or this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't see, again, uh, the EFTA member states, they don't want to join the EU themselves. Yeah. But they, they have left many go through. As I say, the European Economic Area was used as a step towards membership by uh, Norway, but Actually, they vote again, but they were ready to do it, but they voted again. But Austria, Finland, and Sweden, they just went through the European Economic Area for one year, and then they moved in. Yeah. So no, I, I don't think, and, and maybe it could give some sort of new relevance to EFTA. I mean, EFTA is not a very important organization, except for its member states. So if anyone else was to join, I'm sure they'll be cheering in the Secretariat, the headquarter in Geneva, yeah. uh, even if it's for a couple of years. Okay, all right. And uh, okay, 
All right. Well, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up. But anything else you'd like to say? Uh, I mean, it's been a delight having you, but um, anything you'd like to say about just about Scotland and it's possible, you know, and it's, possibilities for international recognition and acceptance into EFTA in the EU? Is there anything you'd like to add? Well, clearly, uh, if it appears to foreign countries that there is a strong democratic backup for any decision that is being made by government or eventually uh, the parliament, uh, we'll make the case for recognition much stronger than if it's kind of a, you know, one vote majority one day in parliament, but the next day they even don't know whether they voted or not. Uh, I mean, I'm sure my Catalan friends will be a bit upset, but the way they did it in Catalonia after the referendum that they were not allowed to hold was not very powerful. Mm -hmm. You could see that. Now, if they had had a proper referendum with a 60% majority or even 51%, but naturally 60 is better than 51, uh, it would have looked much stronger. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of perception for uh, other states. So I hope the democratic process uh, will not be tainted by anything that can cast doubt on the will of the people, and then it will be the will of the people. I'm not Scott, I'm not Catalan, I'm not Flemish, uh, I'm Swiss, and I lose the vote in Switzerland. We tried a couple of times to convince our fellow countrymen to join the EU, we lost. That, that's the rule of democracy. Right. So uh, it's not for me to say what the choice should be. And by the way, even those in Scotland that would vote to remain in the UK, it's part of the right to self-determination. Right to self-determination is not only for those who want independence. Mm. It's for each and every voter to decide what the future of its country will be. Yeah. And if the choice of the majority is to remain in the UK, as it happened in 2014, then it's the choice of the majority. But then I hope that the majority will be wise. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate you having. If you could stay on for a couple minutes after the sure. thing stops, we'd love to have a word with you. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas Levra, for sharing your wisdom with us uh, on these uh, on these very interesting topics. It was my pleasure. Thank you. All right.